perfect solar eclipse is a wondrous thing because it allows us to measure the constituents of the upper layers of the sun's atmosphere. During a solar eclipse, the moon fits so perfectly over the sun that it shields its blinding light, providing astronomers with a view of the star's atmosphere, otherwise impossible to experience. At the moment of totality, the pinkish arc of the chromosphere, the atmosphere's innermost layer becomes visible, and with it, a rainbow-like band called the flash spectrum appears when the sun is viewed through a prism. The eclipse of 1870 led to an understanding of the structure of the sun's chromosphere and the discovery of helium, the second most abundant element in the universe. The spectrum is probably the single greatest source of information about a star. And it was during a couple of historic eclipses in the 19th century that astronomers figure out how the spectrum of the sun is produced. And they only were able to figure it out because of the particular circumstances during a total eclipse. You have to have a nearly perfect match between the sun and the moon, so you don't hide the chromosphere. And that insight afforded by eclipses in the 19th century is what finally permitted astronomers to figure out how the spectra of distant stars are produced. Really, that opened up stellar astrophysics and allowed us to understand how other stars work, because distant stars, after all, are other suns. In the spring of 1919, on May the 29th, research teams headed by British astronomer Arthur Eddington photographed the sun and adjacent stars in the Hyades star cluster during the darkness of totality. Later analysis of the pictures verified that the sun's gravity bent light from distant stars traveling toward the Earth at the angle Albert Einstein had predicted. Einstein's theory of relativity an idea that revolutionized our understanding of the universe had been confirmed during a total solar eclipse. That experiment was only possible because the stars become visible during a total eclipse. They're very important in the history of science. And the best place in the entire solar system to view solar eclipses is from the surface of the Earth. I've actually calculated the circumstances for eclipses from all the other planets and all the other moons, about 65 of them, the, the major moons. And it's an amazing coincidence. The one place that has observers is the one place that has the best eclipses. Was this merely an isolated fluke of nature or a glimpse at a principle and a purpose fundamental to the universe as a whole? What if those things that make a planet habitable also make that planet the best place for making scientific discoveries? That is, what if those rare locations in the universe uh, that are compatible with observers like ourselves are also the best places overall for making observations. The same narrow circumstances that allow us to exist also provide us with the best overall setting for making scientific discoveries. You need a certain mix of elements uh, to support a complex biosphere. Uh, like ours, not just any atmosphere will do. Within the Sun's family of more than 70 planets and moons, the Earth is one of seven bodies enveloped by a thick canopy of gas. Yet among these seven, only the Earth's atmosphere can sustain complex life. And only the Earth's atmosphere is transparent. If the conditions for habitability and scientific discovery appear in the same places, then you're going to get conditions like you do on Earth, an atmosphere that sustains complex life like ourselves and also enables scientific discovery of the universe around us. As the Earth moves through space, it is bombarded by radiation from throughout the universe. This radiation is emitted by the Sun and other celestial objects, including supernovas and distant galaxies. It reaches our planet in wavelengths described as gamma, X-ray, ultraviolet, visible, infrared, microwave, and radio. Together, they comprise the electromagnetic spectrum. Almost all of these wavelengths are invisible to the eye and either lethal or useless to organic life. Yet within this spectrum of frequencies, a thin sliver of radiation proves essential to plants, animals, and human beings. 
In other words, there's really just a very narrow part of the electromagnetic spectrum that's going to be useful for living processes like photosynthesis. It's not as if life could have evolved to use gamma radiation or X-ray radiation or something like that. There's really just a narrow part of the spectrum that would be useful to life processes. Well, as it turns out, that's also the same narrow part of the spectrum that is the most informative about the various structures that we discover in the universe around us. These specific frequencies that enable plants to manufacture food and astronomers to observe the cosmos represent less than one trillionth of a trillionth of the universe's range of natural electromagnetic emissions. Fortunately, it is the type of light our sun produces in abundance, and that most easily penetrates the filtering shield of our atmosphere to reach the surface of the Earth. It's something that you wouldn't expect just chance to produce. Just as our location in the solar system is optimized for habitability, so is our location in the galaxy. While a black hole, exploding stars and deadly radiation would make complex life virtually impossible near the galactic core, the outer edge of the Milky Way poses other challenges to habitability. There probably aren't enough heavy elements to build Earth-sized planets that can support life. So there's a happy median between the dangerous galactic center and the outer edge of the galaxy. There are definitely places in the galaxy that you cannot have civilizations because they're very dangerous. And there are places where you just have a very low abundance of heavy elements. Even within the habitable zone in the galaxy, in spiral arms, which are dangerous places, that's where most of the supernovae go off in the galaxy. That's where uh, the star formation is taking place. We want to be outside the spiral arm at about the right region of the galaxy. It appears this is precisely where the Earth is located. Location is everything, and so we occupy that special place in the galaxy where habitability is optimized, threats are minimized, and we have enough building blocks to build an Earth. The Earth is also located in the best setting within our galaxy for astronomical research. On the surface of the Earth, we're really in the optimum position for seeing both the nearby structure of the Milky Way galaxy, as well as seeing the distant cosmos as a whole. If you didn't have something like gravity that pulled matter together, you would never get planets, you wouldn't get stars, you wouldn't get any complex organisms. If you didn't have the strong nuclear force, there would be nothing to hold protons and neutrons together in the nucleus. And so you wouldn't have any atoms, so no chemistry. If you didn't have the electromagnetic force, you would have no bonding between chemicals. You would have no light, and the list goes on. So you need all these sorts of fundamental principles have to be in place in order for life to occur. Wipe out one of those principles, wipe out one of those laws. No life. Scientists have determined the relative strengths of each of these primary laws and forces. These strengths are so critically balanced, they are often described as being finely tuned. Imagine a machine able to control the strengths of each of the physical constants. If you changed, even slightly from its current setting, the strength of any one of these fundamental forces, such as gravity, the impact on complex life would be catastrophic. These forces and constants are another example of the correlation between life and discovery. For not only are they finely tuned for our existence, they can also be understood. It's remarkable how well the laws work. And not only that, it's remarkable how simple they are. And that also is related to the discoverability of the laws. Albert Einstein wrote, I have deep faith that the principles of the universe will be both beautiful and simple. Many of the most important theories in theoretical physics can be written on a single sheet of paper. And this, I think, uh, ought to be considered surprising, that such, such a simple formula or equation could have such far-reaching applications to a very complicated and very large universe. You have a universe that is not only finely tuned for life to occur, but also has a beautiful, elegant mathematical structure and a structure such that we can discover that structure. It seems then that 
whatever the source of the universe is, it intended that it contain observers who can discover. Copernicus and Kepler and Galileo and Newton himself believed that the universe was the product of a mind, that it was intelligible to beings like ourselves because the universe itself was the product of an intelligent being. They were uncovering God's handiwork in the way the world worked. I mean, what a thought that we can glimpse the mind of God. We can actually figure out how God put the universe together. This is a, a hidden subtext in nature which can be exposed through this procedure we call science.